The Longwood Gardens may be one of the most spectacularly resplendent gardens in the U.S., boasting both architectural and horticultural displays that go beyond earthly imagination. Last time, we didn't get a chance to do a proper tour of the conservatories because there were just too many visitors, which for any botanical garden is a good problem to have. So this time we scheduled a proper behind the scenes tour before they opened to the public. So you could see their plants and displays up close and personal right here on Plant One On Me. So my name is Carl Gersons. I'm the conservatory manager here at Longwood Gardens. I've been here for 25 years. That's just a few Woo! years. And uh, this place is amazing. You know, originally being from Mississippi, I grew up in a really hot, humid climate. Yeah. And coming to Pennsylvania, you know, it's not so hot and humid in the winter time. But the conservatory gives you that perfect, you know, environment where you can grow plants from around the world. Oh yeah. 65 days. Wait, I feel like you kicked your southern accent a little bit. Well, I can turn it on if you need me to. But uh, <laughs> then, you know, sometimes people can't understand what I'm talking about with the flowers. I feel like when you go back home, it turns on again. <laughs> Indeed. You know, the sweet tea and then, of course, all the tropical plants. Oh, that yeah. Really, well, that it doesn't look it like you drink a lot of sweet tea. Well, yeah, I do. I spend a lot of time moving throughout the garden, you know, planting yeah. palm trees. And that's what we're doing here. We're creating a flower show type display. So yeah. it's not just planting at one time. We're constantly turning these displays over, sometimes Which is every crazy week. To me. It's crazy to me that you're, you, that, that, I mean, wh where do the plants go? Do you just like uproot them and like, Great questions. Where, where do the plants grow? Should where do I they come from? Well, you know, looking at these lilies, these yeah. beautiful yellow lilies, this yeah. is a cultivar called Conca de Or. This is a wonderful Dutch hybrid, incredibly fragrant, huge flowers, almost the size of your hand. And uh, believe it or not, these were just planted yesterday. Oh my gosh. So these, oh. you know, look like they've been there for several months. Yeah. They're put in yesterday, they'll last for two weeks. Yeah. Then they'll get changed out and we'll replace them with something either different or with a different succession. I, I, I always love these lilies because I always uh, would tell my friends, oh, you got to smell it, it's amazing. Oh, gosh, and then they just get like this. The all, pollen on them. The and they cannot get it off. <laughs> it's just like this brown stain on their face. Well, you know, put it in the right spot, you know, it can like rosy your cheeks yeah. up a little bit. But <laughs> exactly. things like the lilies, you know, they last for two weeks, but things like the palm trees, I mean, mm -hmm. they're in pots, so those will get rotated out. Uh, they were put in last April. They've been moved since they were put in in April, and they might get moved again. So it's like moving wow. furniture inside your house. We Insane. can rearrange. We can create flower show type displays. I can't imagine they could handle all that movement all the time. You well, know? you know, plants are resilient. So yeah. I often have heard that plants are not horticultural unless you've moved them three times. <laughs> oh, so. that, that's something that's something that must come here with like the frequent changeovers. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, if you're not changing plants, I'll say, what are you doing in the garden? You know, in my own garden, I'm deadheading, I'm raking yeah. leaves. But in here, you know, we're creating different types of displays. Look at the red lip on this cymbidium. Mm -hmm. You know, cymbidium orchids are great for a cool season. It's one of the only orchids I can grow inside my home. And then we were inspired by that red lip to then echo with these red uh, cyclamen down here. Yeah. So you have this little bit of you know carryover with colors. How do you how do you plan it out? Like, because when I'm planning a garden, I like sketch things out. But I can't imagine like if you're turning over things like on a weekly basis, like. 365 Even, days of the year. Do you sketch things out like in the the beginning part of the year? Like, I don't do, do any you, sketching at all. No, nothing. So we have a big plan. And it's yeah. really just the conservatory, and uh -huh. it's blank lines, and we just go by line. So it starts off with your favorite plant. Mm. So on this walkway, I said lilies. We've got to have lilies. Mm. What color lilies are we going to have? Right. Yellow lilies. What are we going to put with the yellow lilies? Oh, we have these cymbidiums. They have to go somewhere. What can we then pair with the cymbidiums? Inspired by the red lip, then we get the red cyclamen. Right. And bang, that's how one walkway goes. Okay, so you're literally, it's like layering in a very organic fashion. Indeed. Yeah. And that's just this walkway. We yeah. have nine other walkways with <laughs> pinks and whites and oranges. And then how long do these last? So yeah. there's a lot of moving parts through there. I oftentimes uh, say that when you're designing your own garden, you mm -hmm. think, oh, tulips, I'm going to have pink tulips mm. next spring. You plant them in the fall and you're done. Mm. Well, we're going to have pink tulips this week. But what about <laughs> next week? and the week after. So it's always, you know, thinking about the next layer. I mean, it really keeps you on your toes. I, I mean, do you have any permanent collections here? Oh, we do, as a matter yeah. of fact. And, you know, some of the most beautiful permanent collections, I think, are some of the gardens that we have uh, kind of captured throughout the rest of the conservatory complex. The main conservatory is our flower show type display. Got it. You know, beautiful flowers, 365 days of the year. But as we go into the Acacia Passage, talk about beautiful permanent yeah. displays. And you know, you're here at just the right time to see these oh, things in bloom. Everything is in bloom, and the, it feels like Easter, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the purples and yellows and the fragrance. Well, don't oh worry, because next week we're changing all these colors out entirely. <laughs> so it's purple and pink this week, but next week it will all be yellow. Oh my gosh.
this is such a fun plant, Acacia leprosa. This is a plant from Australia, and for all the people that we've talked to in Australia, they've really never heard of it. No one grows it. It has a really peculiar smell. Isn't that a fun thing? So it's called cinnamon wattle. I don't really no, know where the cinnamon comes I don't, from. I don't smell any cinnamon. It's it's much more, um, it's punchier. There's Ooh, like a... I like that. Plants with punch. Yeah. yeah I feel a book coming yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> It definitely has, it has a very unique, it almost like has a little, I don't know, sour is not the word for it, but oh, it's like a that. very unique. Uh, oh, I have another fragrance we'll have to look at later on. Hmm. Look at the way the flowers form though. You've yeah. got these little tiny unopened flower buds down there in the palm of my hand. And then as they get older, they turn into these little puff balls. And then we have what, three, four feet of these things just dangling from the air. They only bloom for one month and you are here the perfect time to I, see I it. mean, this is the perfect time. This is exquisite. Do you hear the angel singing? It's like, <laughs> oh. This is an exquisite piece because when we were here last time, none of this was in bloom. Absolutely. I don't even think, well, these might have been changed out. I don't Absolutely. Know. <laughs> the goal is every month to have a completely different basket, a different yeah. color combination. Because this long passageway gives you a wonderful moment to kind of have purples and yellows. Yeah. Next, all yellow. Then pink than red. So my goal is to change it literally monthly. We haven't quite gotten to that point yet, but you know, you gotta have things to work towards in your garden. Yeah. But these plectranthus are fantastic, I think. This is a new hybrid. Uh, these guys coming from South Africa. Look at the little flowers, the faces on those guys. Individually, there's so much to appreciate with yeah. these things. And then when you pair them, the purples and the pinks, you know, then it just creates this magical moment, I think. That's what anyone can do in their own backyard. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Have... Well, especially when you look at it like from the pot's perspective, because Longwood is that type of garden. It feels like Disney World in the best sense. You're like, I, I, this is so grandiose. But if you take pieces of absolutely. Longwood, you could take pieces of Longwood with you. And that's where I get yeah. inspiration from as well. I visit people's gardens and they're like, oh, you know, my garden is nothing like Longwood. Yeah. And my thing is, thank you. I'm glad it's not. <laughs> I need some diversity in my life. But one container combination could be all the inspiration we need right. to inspire us to do an entire display. Right. One person on their front porch had yellow, orange, and white. I'm like, I love that combination. Mm. And then we just get 500 plants and <laughs> make it happen, and you have a moment at Longwood. Now, are you growing a lot of your own plants here? We are, or? as a matter okay. of fact. So we've got a huge production facility here at Longwood, and we're producing things you can't really buy off the shelf. So, of course, who's producing this specific color of lily mm. in this quantity uh, at this date? The, so the we Dutch? have to do, well, they're, they're growing the bulbs. <laughs> If only they grew the finished product, we would buy it from them. So we do have to grow lots of these plants here at Longwood if right. they're going to You have to, to grow be. them out to maturity is what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. So from a production standpoint, yes, the Dutch are certainly producing yeah. lots of the you know, baby starter plants. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as you know, the finished product, that's something that we have to produce here at Longwood. Right. And here you can see the lilies in full flower. The fragrance is just you know, overwhelming us with... Uh, the scent of really late summer, yeah. but here it is in February, and you've got that scent of another season. Right. So what I love to do is just kind of close my eyes, feel the sun on your face, and then have that fragrance just permeate. And you've, you've been taken away. You've been taken somewhere else. You sound like a perfumer. <laughs> <laughs> if only I knew more about that. Yeah. But yeah, we did have a fragrance exhibit here at Longwood several years ago, and the perfumers were coming here, and they were picking up on those subtle scents mm. like you were talking about with the acacias, with lilies, maybe with orchids. Yeah. And all these different things were great ways to kind of see what their aspect is. Yeah, it's actually nice to have that olfactory sense when it comes to it, because even then I was like, that smells different, but you almost don't have the vocabulary to describe what you're smelling, because it could be such a unique smell, but then you have to like try to place the foundation on something something else, and you're like, eh, does it smell clovey, or does it smell, like it has to smell like something else, but in order to find that vocabulary, and I think you find that when you have like, wine sommeliers, you know, that kind of perfumers, you know, they have that kind of vocabulary to be able to express Absolutely. That. Well, plant people, you know, we talk about roots and shoots and all the yeah. things in between and what other people do with our plants. I think that's the magic of it. Yeah, absolutely. Other incredible permanent plants that we have, I mean, as we move into the silver garden, we've got some great collections that have been around for probably 30 years, uh, just in our displays here. The space that we currently have our silver garden occupying was an original piece of Mr. DuPont's conservatory complex where he was growing espalier nectarines. So imagine this was completely utilitarian when Mr. DuPont was here. 
And then after... So he was growing nectarines in this particular spot. In this specific space. He was growing nectarines. Yeah. And uh, when he passed away and we turned this more into a botanical garden, then we transitioned into economic plants, things that people could relate to, coffee and tea and rubber. And then we wanted to transition into something a little more sustainable. Yeah. So our silver garden is the answer to our sustainable mission. So this is one that is more permanent than you're saying. Absolutely. And when we say permanent, <laughs> how permanent are we talking? Because we're changing plants on a regular basis. <clears throat> Oh, so Come here at Christmas time. Dude, that happens five times a day. Oh. I mean, this is my look of concern. I'm like... <laughs> I like that you didn't, <clears throat> you didn't even break a face. <laughs> Absolutely. I was like, got to keep going. No retakes. I'm pretty good about estimating where plants are, but this point here is sticking out so much. Don't you even worry about it. <laughs> That'll be part two. It's like, hmm, the redesign. It's like, hmm, why do we... Not want to have plants like that. <laughs> now this garden has been, so yes, it is permanent. So permanent in the sense that, you know, the cactus and the trees, yes, they've been here since the late 80s in yeah. this specific space. Some of those trees were certainly here before that. But when we look at things like the Artemisias, mm -hmm. the Dusty Millers, the Vresias, those will change on a somewhat regular basis. Hmm. Vresias might last about two years before mm -hmm. they flower. Uh, our Dusty Millers might last about a year before they succumb to summer heat. Right. Uh, things like Artemisias might last two years before they get overgrown. Right. So then we have those on the schedule that now, they're rotating through. Now, even with these, with their two years, like, are you cutting off their flower heads just so you could focus on the foliage? Absolutely. Okay. So in the Silver Garden, you know, we don't allow plants to flower. You'll find <laughs> the occasional purple, maybe a white bloom every now mm -hmm. and again. But in the Silver Garden, it's all about those textures. Uh, of silvers and whites. Right. So we are cutting off the yellow flowers of Artemisia. We're cutting off any of the yellow flowers. It seems like lots of silver plants have yellow flowers. Yeah, so it's true. It's we're, we're going really against true. nature in yeah. here. But then again, that's what horticulture is. Yeah. Your horticulture is all about manipulating those plants and having them do something they don't do naturally. Yeah. Even selecting the hand of the, a gardener. The hand of a gardener. I like that. Right. Yeah, these plants maybe wouldn't occur naturally. We've got non-hardy plants growing. You know, Brazilian bromeliads yeah. growing right next to Mexican agaves, <laughs> uh, next to African euphorbias. That's that's and an incredible piece right there, though. Like that is. This is what I think a, a conservatory can do for you. Mm -hmm. You create these moments of whimsy and wonder that aren't natural. Mm. And it's like creating a flower arrangement. You know, these plants didn't grow naturally, but we're still enjoying them together. So now we're doing that with the garden. I like also though, like for somebody who's coming in and not just like passing through and just looking at it from an eye perspective of saying, oh yeah, it's all silver, that's kind of cool. But really thinking about it, like these plants have grown up in different environments and in different habitats, but they've developed or they've co-evolved similar colors or maybe features or structures. And then you can intuit well, why did they do that? Is it just really sunny in some of these places? Is it drought stricken? And that's why they have these furry trichomes on. So it's interesting to place them side by side because you could actually see some of those co-evolutions or the things that connect them morphologically speaking. Indeed, and that's of course getting down to the botany of these things. Yeah. And oftentimes when I'm teaching these plants to our students, I say plants are silver for three reasons. Mm. What makes them silver? Mm. Hair mm -hmm. protects you, scales, clothing, mm -hmm. or blue stuff, which mm -hmm. is you know the sunscreen. Exactly. So plants are just like people. Mm. You know? And also plants are like people in a sense that they need to eat on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. How many times do we just fertilize one time in the springtime and then we're done with it. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes I like to tell people you need to fertilize weekly mm -hmm. as in time frame but then also fertilize weekly as in half stream. Mm -hmm. So giving a little bit of food on a regular basis is such a great way to keep your plants thriving. Mm -hmm. Now once a plant has reached full maturity we will certainly lay off the fertilization. We don't need the plants to continue growing anymore. We now want them to mm -hmm. slow down a little bit. But maintaining a plant with that you know, weak solution of fertilizer, hmm. I think is one of the best uh, tips that I've ever heard before. And even so, if you're uh, taking a plant out, are you uh, composting it? Are you, take, are you keeping it in some place? Because I can imagine you acquire so many plants at the end of the day. Like, how, how does one do it? <laughs> we, we go through a lot of plants. Yeah. But, you know, just like I say in your home garden, you would never keep petunias past yeah. their use date. Yeah. So the same is for us. You know, down here this past uh, Christmas, we had a lot of visitation. So 
Uh, some of these areas got you know, trampled a little bit, so we had to replace it with these little sempervivums. And these little sempervivums will eventually you know, get a little too large for their space, so right. we'll change them out. And maybe we'll put them in favor of something a little more unusual, something that people maybe haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly rotating these things through, but rest assured, when a plant has finished its usable mm -hmm. life here at Longwood, there's not much left to it. Yeah. So when it does go to compost, we're happy to see it there. And it's also helping the it, next generation. It becomes plant food. Absolutely. So lots of these plants are, of course, growing in you know, last year's plants. Now back up here is a really fun plant, the agave americana, our big blue one. Right that thing you know, commonly called the century plant. And uh, for years, I wondered, where does that common name come from? Because it lives for a century? <laughs> well, it lives for a century in its it native flowers. habitat. Oh, okay. So it takes about 100 years for the plant to build up the energy that it needs to produce that flower. But I like to say here at Longwood in our conservatories, this one is in Club Med. So it's getting plenty of water, plenty of fertilizer. It'll actually bloom in about 10 years. The life wow. of a rock star. You wow. Know? So, so now the blooms, when I look at it, I mean, this is in the asparagus family. Indeed. Because when I saw the blooms starting, I was like, that just looks like a giant <laughs> asparagus on Viagra. That's exactly <laughs> like, right. Like, it's crazy. I mean, the flower spike, I would imagine, could even 30 penetrate feet tall. through. Yeah. So what we do is it blooms in the summer. This is yeah. the third one I've seen since I've been here. We take the glass out. And then the spike goes through the glass and then blooms outside the greenhouse in Unreal. the summertime. So after the summer season is over, all the leaves are cut off, the entire plant is taken out, we already have the next plant ready to go in there. And how do you cut the leaves off? Is it like with a, I mean. It, with a big saw. A saw. So you okay. need a big pole saw. You need yeah. something that you're not getting too close to that plant because those spines are definitely going to be yeah, kind of vicious. But, you know, yeah. the fun thing about agaves, if you haven't seen this before, I love that they produce this thing called ghosting. So if you look at the underside of these leaves down mm -hmm. here, we have the imprint of the former leaves when they were all cupped together. Mm. And if you feel that, it's literally, I mean, it's hard. So it's a permanent imprint. It's like a scar. Yeah. So I remind people, don't sleep too long in the mornings because yeah. you're going to have that permanent pillow imprint. Or at least with your, your jeans on tight. <laughs> exactly. With your jeggings on. You know? <laughs> this is what it's going to look like on your legs. <laughs> but this agave, this is a smaller version of agave perii, uh, does the same thing. You know, Once it flowers, the whole thing will die. But we can see we have little babies. We have little pups yeah. already being produced at the bottom. And those can be taken off, potted up, given to friends. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll save a couple to replace these when they flower. So even this garden. It's nice to have a friend at Longwood. <laughs> How many do you need? <laughs> <laughs> hey, friend? Hey, yeah. But with these guys, Sorry, you know, continue. <laughs> we've got uh, you know, backups behind the scenes ready to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're constantly you know, rotating these gardens. So even though the palm might be you know, original, uh, to 1988, mm -hmm. uh, the blue chalk sticks, the curio, those yeah. are being replaced this May. Mm -hmm. And these I think are so fun too. They show you that that blue coating. Yeah. As you could easily to, wipe it off. Exactly. Yeah. And that's you know the, the sun protectant right there. Mm -hmm. So our sunscreen, you know, whether it's waterproof or not, once it's rubbed off of a plant, it's mm -hmm. not coming back on there. Right. But it's really a cool way to show Looks that. It's like a green bean, though. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. And they're not poisonous, but <laughs> no. I'm not going to taste it. So. <laughs> but uh, the blue chalk sticks are one of the most, I think, fun plants we have here in the Silver Garden. Yeah. It also shows you the different shades of silver. Yes. You've got white silver, blue silver, green silver. I mean, it's just, to a person who loves color, it's just a way to explore all the way through that one. Well, I, I mean, I love it. It does remind me of more, you know, a lot of times you see Mediterranean gardens and that kind of, it has, and a lot of those Mediterranean plants like have that kind of coloration as well. This is calming to me because mm. it isn't a, a barrage of colors. It actually is more muted even though you have the subtleties that you pick up. But this to me has an immediate calming effect. And that's the great thing about Longwood is mm. each of the galleries or gardens that you walk through mm -hmm. is going to have a similar uh, effect. So this one is calming, and when you go next door, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And then when you go down the Acacia Passage, it's calming again. Mm -hmm. So you get this wonderful kind of roller coaster yeah, of emotions as you're going you, through if you, here. If you want that, yeah. <laughs> and look at that. We need to get a little a hairbrush on our, yeah. our cactus down here. <laughs> but you know, just to stop and appreciate each individual plant, I yeah. think it's so much fun because it's one thing to see the garden overall as a beautiful place, mm -hmm. but when you slow down and look at each individual plant. Uh, that's what these cacti were designed to do. When our designer, Isabel Green, put these together. I also like these guys. These are, oh, aren't these, fine? These have been recently reclassified into Caputia, and they used to be Senecio Hawarthi, uh, Senecio, I think, Hawarthiae. Yeah. Yep. 
but they have been recently reclassified. We actually, but we actually have an episode about the gentleman who has reclassified these, actually. I want to so. thank him for <laughs> changing the names, because we love plant name changes. Yeah. Just when you think you know everything, <laughs> let's relearn it. No, you got to reprint everything. <laughs> that, that seems facetious. Oh, <laughs> well, it keeps, it keeps the world occupied, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but look at the diversity in our cacti here. So we talk about, you know, this little kid, crazy hair. This one's yeah. a little taller and skinnier. Yeah. This one's got a big head. You know, this <laughs> one hasn't hit his growth spurt yet. So plants, just like people, they've got such personalities. All right, this is where the excitement starts again. It's all the color. Oh my gosh, and color. so much color. And, and the you smell, know, too, the smell. Oh, especially this time of year. The yeah. citrus are flowering. We've got so many beautiful fragrances. But I kind of feel like this is the time to come because, uh, you know, we can't film outdoors. There's not, you know, you can, but you, but it's cold and it's, it's, it's not uh, as pleasant. But here is like, because you're constantly focusing on getting the stuff in flower and foliage or whatever looks the best you it's know? just near perfect all the time that's yeah. what's so, so so fun I about hate it. it come on I hate it. It's <laughs> now you so know perfect one of my favorite things is you know if people aren't talking about what you're doing mm -hmm. then maybe you're not doing enough so <laughs> I don't want to say that that was you know the idea behind this walkway but here's the question what do you think about these colors so we have this euphorbia yeah and how would you describe that color I would say a uh, a fire engine red with a little bit of pink. Okay, yeah. there we go. Definitely a little bit of pink to it. Yeah. And then how about our Plectranthus back here? It's got a little bit more softness to it. Yeah, like a more like uh, eggplanty pink. Oh, I like yeah. that. <laughs> Lovely terms there. And then when we look at our bromeliads back there in the back, that cultivar called America. Yeah, and that kind of brings together the colors. It ties yeah, them together. Does, You're exactly right. Because individually, you might think, ooh, these very strong-minded strong, colors, yeah. they might not work together but then you get that bridge. Yeah. And that is half the fun of some of these intense colors. What is this fireworky type of plant? Oh my gosh, isn't that fantastic? This is Clarodendron quadriculare. And uh, this plant I first saw. I would never think about this as a clarodendron. Oh, there are so many clarodendrons. We have vines and shrubs. This one's been trained as a standard here at Longwood. But when I first saw it in 2000 in Grand Cayman, it was just a giant, like 12 foot bush. Wow. Blooming in the dead of winter. And I said, hmm, we could use that, but we don't need a giant 12 foot bush. So what can we do at Longwood but to manipulate the plant? So do you graft it. it onto something or? These don't even have to be grafted. We just grow these from cuttings. Uh -huh. It takes about two years to get that single stem, pinch the top and then poof, you've got this amazing plant which only lasts for about two years. Then it gets overgrown, mm. but we've already got new ones started kind of behind the scenes. But they naturally bloom in the dead of winter, January and February. Uh, we can manipulate them and have them bloom even later in the year till April and May. But look, look I think how January- Look some of these are being lifted up now. <laughs> isn't that fun? Yeah. So our streptocarpus baskets out there, those are on winches. So uh -huh. we lower them down in order to water them, in order to maintain them. And then uh, through the magic of Longwood, they get raised back up. Unbelievable. And I should say that we're kind of like here just, you know, 45 minutes before it actually opens. So we're getting a chance to actually see this a little bit behind the scenes. You there know, you go. When, when folks aren't here yet, quite yet. These are gorgeous. I've seen these growing in Florida actually quite recently. And they're called, uh, what are they, can candles? Whatever. So Clarodendron schmidtii is yes. commonly called chains of glory or Chain light bulb plants. Oh, light bulb plants, yeah. Isn't yeah. that fun? Chains of glory and yeah, light bulb, yeah. The little flower buds do look like little light bulbs, mm -hmm. and I do love those. And this is a plant that, again, I was looking at these in Florida myself, a little too cold down there for them. They mm. start to lose some of their foliage. Mm. But here at Longwood, with the warmth of the conservatory, I think even Floridians would come and be impressed by <laughs> what these are looking like. So this was the year of the clarodendron. This is what kind of anchored our center walk display. So we had about 90 of these shrubs. Uh, next year it will change entirely. So take your picture now because <laughs> when you come back, it will not look the same. We're making the plans for next year and uh, we're always thinking about what's our favorite plant or what's yeah. our favorite combination. And then we're going to use that to then build next year's display. Yeah. So right now the Cestrum making a fantastic display over on this walkway and Bizarre. I Isn't think I just saw actually a pollinator there, just kind of a little fly pollinator kind of coming around. I was uh, Those are cool. telling someone that, you know, they're like very that's waxy. What we'll have at. These are very arching, kind yeah. of loose. But here at Longwood, we've pinched these and we've created these wonderful compact shrubs. Yeah. So anyone who knows this plant would think, mine doesn't look like that. Mm. And then whenever I hear those types of things, then I know we've done well because yeah. we want to create something that isn't what you're gonna see at home. 
It's one of those things where I say, don't try this at home. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of effort, a lot of work, but just to show people that you, know, you can manipulate plants and you can have them do things other than what they've always done. This looks like a hummingbird plant, like a hummingbird oh, would love to dip its I beak can in there. imagine. And yeah. these things are full of nectar, absolutely. Yeah. So when they're growing naturally outdoors in California or South Texas and Florida, you will definitely see the pollinators just going crazy over them. And then you have all these little tiny little roses. Aren't they the cutest things? So these roses are fortunately grown for us in Canada. So this is an example of where we're using plants from other suppliers as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So we have Canadian growers, Florida growers, California growers, and we're bringing them all together to create these displays. Uh, Longwood, of course, has to produce things that we can't buy mm -hmm. from somewhere else. So fortunately, the Canadians have done a great job with these miniature roses. Uh, perfectly hardy, they're just cuttings six inches long, mm -hmm. and it's remarkable through horticulture how they've created, I think, this magic. How do you get a full-size rose, rose on a yeah. six-inch stem yeah. and then 10 of them in a pot? I mean, it's... And it's, blooming. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's just incredible. And you know, using the colors there, we mm -hmm. wanted the pinks and the reds and then just echo a little bit of the yellow behind it. So there's just always you know, moments of inspiration, mm. I think, as we go through the gardens. And that might have been kind of exciting, lots of color. But then what if you want to calm down a little bit? And this yellow roldana is a super fun plant I found at the San Francisco Botanic Garden 20 years like ago. It looks like a pacara, or is it in the Asterisi? Absolutely, yeah. yep, you definitely recognize that. It has a little fragrance to it, yeah. I think. Oh, I just love that scent. But this is uh, roldana pedicitis. Ooh, well, yeah. mm. So meaning uh, leaves look like pedicites mm. because they're so big. Mm -hmm. But this is a cloud forest plant that comes from the high elevations of Mexico. Oh wow, fascinating. Blooms naturally this time of year. We mm. don't have to do anything to it. So now yellow has started our color combination. And then what can we do with that yellow? Look at the dots on this little Diffenbachia down here, yep. little yellow dots. Mm -hmm. And then we echo that with our yellow Guzmania. Mm -hmm. And then just for fun, throwing in some of those red Dracaenas. Right. Just to have something a little different. But keep in mind, even things like the palm trees, these are temporary. So these were just put in. Unreal. Just put in last April. So they'll be coming out later on this year and it just changes the look entirely. Crazy. So if you visited Longwood before, you've got to come back next week, next <laughs> month, because it will definitely change. Well, for somebody who is like a frequent visitor here, they'll never see the same thing twice. That is know, the goal. We always want to make sure that there's something new and different. And yeah, we're always trying new and different things. Yeah. So in something like our garden path area, this is kind of our trials area. So we're doing little moments, two plants, three plants. And then you look down and you think, oh, I like this yellow and red combination mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. How can I expand that? Right. Or look at how this red complements or accents that one. Right, so you're kind of painting in your palette back here. Absolutely. And you're saying, can we actually extrapolate this to a much larger space? And not just color, but texture. Yeah. I mean, look at things like, you know, the Sansevieria, mm -hmm. um, common house plants, and people think, heuchera, that grows outdoors in my own garden. Right. Heucheras and house plants together? Mm. Again, the magic of the conservatory, you can do it all here. So you don't have to think about, does this plant work? We literally can indulge our passions. We can think about color and texture and form and not have to worry about any of those other things about, you know, is this gonna survive the sun? Is it gonna not take the moisture that I have? All free for all. Love that you're experimenting and you have some gingers, right? Or is it? Costas, yeah. yeah. Costas, These yeah. little guys are so fun. And yeah. I don't think we have too many flowers that are open but there might be one flower open there. And if yeah. you pull that one out, have you ever tasted that? I have never. They are delicious. No, are I'll, I'll give you the one flower that we have left there. Okay. You can just pull that one out. Okay. Like a little kernel of corn. Okay. And it's just, it's- Like a candy corn it almost. It is, it is okay. so good. I mean, I'm so, so jealous. It's a gift. The whole thing. It's crunchy. And it's a prank. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's- um, Waiting for it, waiting for okay. it. It's got a little, um, hmm, the, a very tiny hint, very tiny hint, like as if you watered down rhubarb a little bit. Ah, okay. It has a little sour aftertaste. Yes. Um, it's not that sweet. No. No. Well, so it's a little young, but I think yeah. it's like green plums. 
I used to eat Green plums. Plums is interesting. Before they were ripe, yeah. and I love crunchy plums. It definitely plums. has that feel feel of something that's underripe. Yes. I used to do that with gooseberries. Yes. Gooseberries have a little bit of that. Uh, I couldn't wait for them to ripen. Yeah. I just I'm ready for them right there. So every time I come through here and I see one, I just like have a little taste. It takes me back to my childhood. That's amazing. And it just kind of reminds me of like, ah, oh, summertime fruits. I'm definitely one of those folks who like, if somebody's like, oh, eat this, I will. I usually <laughs> won't think twice. I like to eat the little sugar crystals off of like some of the plants that have it like for the ants. And I'm Ooh, like, they're very tasty. Like, they are. My rip, solace, uh, my rip solace had a little, some sugar cubes. And I was like, oh, this is, and they taste exactly like sugar. Well, you know, now that we're talking about these yeah. tasty things, I've never done this before. So I mean, <laughs> Shall we try this together? <laughs> so here we have Aka Siloiana. I mean, first of all, the most gorgeous thing you've ever seen, right? That's, it looks like little, like, uh, puffed pillows, and then you have oh this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Supposedly, plumage. this is edible. So <laughs> okay, if, if you're, if you're, <laughs> if, you're <laughs> if you're game here. I'm game, I'm totally I'm, game, yeah. I'll try it too. Okay, the petals. Uh, the petals. A lot, of the, a lot of petals are edible. I mean, I'm sure you can eat the pollen, but yeah. it might be a little dusty tasting. So okay. here we go, ready? Yeah. Mm. Oh, the texture. Oh, my. Wow. Wow, there's another one on here. I'm going, I'm going back for round two already. I need something for me. Here, here, you try the pollen. Here, try it. Try it. It literally melts in your mouth. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That is probably Maybe the, we'll have another one just probably, to make sure. That's probably the best petal I've ever tasted. Right? Because you eat a lot of petals like in your... In oh, your, my um, gosh. That was like really a, good. Incredible. Yeah, don't try this along with. <laughs> This is, this is not going to have any flowers. Oh <laughs> my gosh, I didn't know this was so tasty. Oh, well. This one was not as sweet. You're right. It's strange. You got just the perfect one. It didn't melt the same way in the, as the first one. Hmm, I'm going to have to try more of this. Oh wait, that had a nice aftertaste though. This does have a little, a little bite if yeah. you ask me. Hmm. Yeah. How interesting. Wow, that is so cool. <laughs> the things we learned in the garden <laughs> path. <laughs> That well, how about begonias? Have you ever tasted begonia flowers? No, I have never. Oh my tasted. gosh, these are these are tasty as well. Okay. Here we are grazing in the garden path. <laughs> so I like to get the ones that are unopened. Unopened? Okay. I, just because okay. there's less pollen in there. Okay. Okay. So I mean, you can certainly have oh, those. Oh, okay. This one. And they're very sweet, so I just kind of eat literally the entire thing. Ooh. Ooh, that has like a nice little bite to like a lettuce. Mm -hmm. Like a lettuce. Absolutely mm -hmm. delicious. So begonia flowers are sweet, they're tarts, you know, they're beautiful in salads. Wow. And uh, people you know, don't often think about all these edible things that you know, they could grow in their own gardens. They're beautiful. Mm. That has a, a really nice, fresh, like, zing to it. Oh, I like that. Zing. Like um, like a wild lettuce plant. You know, it, it's, it hasn't, it still has its wildness to it. I didn't it. know we should have brought a bowl and a fork. I know, you know exactly. totally indulged. <laughs> Dude, Speaking I'm not, of indulgement. I'm, eat, I'm eating all this with my hands. There's no fork involved. <laughs> oh, so that was a little taste on your tongue. Here's a little taste in your yeah. nose. We but got if more you lilies. A little taste, you can smell oh, while you're eating. You I know? mean, really, it just the fragrance of these lilies, it <laughs> absolutely is just mind boggling. And again, the fact that, you know, they're out of season. Mm -hmm. You know, color combinations, anthuriums and lilies, those don't grow naturally together. No. So we're creating entire gardens that are, you know, whimsical and fantastic. And uh, I think that's, again, the joy of what we can do here. Amaryllis, I mean, this is amaryllis season. Look at these incredible uh, diversity of these guys. Mostly, you know, from South America, hybridized in Holland, and we probably have 10 or 15 different cultivars in flower right now. Now, this is funny because I think I had seen these Stromanthes the last time I was here, and they might have been in the same location. <laughs> we moved the furniture impossible. a little bit now. <laughs> Sandra's like, impossible. impossible. And this one's actually starting to flower. So someone came yeah. to us the other day and they're like, you know, what's the secret to making Stromanthe flower? And I said, number one, I think it takes age. Yeah. And you're inside your home, you know, they're not the best house plants. No, they aren't. But if you could have a warm, humid environment, you know, the that entire family time. family is tough. It definitely is. The whole is. family is, yeah. is tough as house plants. No doubt. You know? And of yeah. course, the other one too, people say that things like Abutilon make mm -hmm. great houseplants. Mm -hmm. I haven't had great success with them as a houseplant. Right. But when you can grow them outdoors, I mean, they're just incredible. This one called Red Tiger. I mean, I'm not a painter, but if I were, I mean, I would just want to paint this or a paper mache artist mm -hmm. and create a lampshade mm -hmm. or something out of that. I'm just sure incredible. somebody has, you know, I'm sure somebody has. Well, if has. they're watching, please contact me because yeah. I'm ready to buy my lampshade <laughs> made out of that uh, Abutilon. <laughs> 
So this wonderful huge fern we have up here. Oh, wow. So this is the rabbit's foot fern. This is our big rabbit's foot fern. Wow. Originally planted, I think they said in 1955. I wasn't here then. Anybody <laughs> was wondering. <laughs> I do know the person who originally installed this in our former Cascade Garden. And he said that it was just a small plant when he put it in. And he's since retired, and I'm still in contact with him. And we le we've literally just wrapped it with stainless steel cables now. So it's a root ball hanging from the sky. There might be a pot in there somewhere, but no one has seen it. Either that, it's, it's consumed it. We now have this you know, stainless steel plate on the underside. It's just a root ball hanging from the sky. Unreal. And how big would you say this is? I mean, it must be 15 is, feet wide? Yeah, I mean, but it, look at the height too. Oh, at least 12 feet tall? Yeah, it's really intense. I mean, just crazy. And you know, we have other ferns, these guys. I mean, guys. it looks like a tree canopy. <laughs> you, you could be the trunk. Yeah, you could stand if you underneath put the trunk it. under there, you'd say that's a tree canopy. <laughs> and you know, the great thing about these is you, you saw the feet, the rabbit's feet, and they're just so touchable. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's a great way to get kids you know, interested in plants because mm -hmm. you know, plants aren't just to look at. Sometimes they taste good, and yeah. sometimes they feel interesting. And, you know, ferns sometimes feel plastic. Yeah. And I think that's half the fun of these things is all the senses that are awoken when you're in horticulture. Walking through here, it's so redolent, like a uh, scent. Every place that we go to, it has all the air pockets are like filled with fragrance. And I think that's this time of year. You yeah. know, the conservatory is its most fragrant in the winter. Hmm. So February, March, especially again when our citrus are flowering, it's just the time of year that it's like no other. I and love the variegation on the spicus. Ooh, you've said my favorite word there. Yeah. Did you say variegation? Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> variegation is amazing. This spicus, uh, natalensis, uh, commonly called the triangle fig. Mm -hmm. First of all, the leaf shape is ridiculously cool. Yeah. But for those people who are artists, I mean, each leaf is like it's hand painted. It, it does. So, this one's called Malay Gold. Super awesome seen that. plant. I haven't seen that one. This one's available from several mail order places like oh. uh, Logies and Steve Leaves. Oh, Logies. Okay, and Steve, of course, Steve, yeah. Great places. Two places that we've highlighted <laughs> and that I have love been those in business folks. for a very, very long time. <laughs> And when you look at this incredible plant over here, we've got one of my favorites. And look at Wait, the light. is that variegated? Oh, uh, well, if we can call it variegated. I, I mean, it looks like it's been bleached. I mean, well, you know, went to a bad <laughs> salon, I guess. But this is an asparagus fern, obviously. Yeah. And uh, I saw one like this at the Philadelphia Flower Show about 15 years ago and wanted this one so badly. Mm -hmm. Uh, put a call out on social media, and don't you know a local person was like, I have one, would you like a piece of it? Wow. Stop it, yes I would. And you know, we got this little tiny plant, and yeah. now it's taken about eight years for us to get this. What makes this thing so amazing? First of all, the new growth starts out solid white, and then it fades to kind of That's half crazy. green, and then it fades to solid green during the summer. So it literally changes color. So where is the chlorophyll in this? I have not figured out how this plant works yet. I see, I see a, maybe a little chlorophyll in the stem. It somehow, it infuses through the entire plant. It changes color throughout the year. New I mean, growth in the dead of winter. This looks dead, but when you feel it, you're like, this is clearly alive. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. I mean, talk about excitement in horticulture. Huh. I mean, even we ask the question, how does this happen? Yeah. And uh, one of my absolute favorite plants. So asparagus ferns, not a real fern at all. Yeah. That's another fun thing about common names. But uh, this one's ready for repotting, so maybe we'll get a second one out of it this coming year. I think you can. I think you can. I think you can make that happen. Hey, do you want to be a hummingbird for a moment? I will. I will. I will be a hummingbird. Let's go see if we've got some pollen on our aloes down here. Aloes are generally full of nectar. Mm -hmm. So these guys are in full flower. What I do right. is just put my hand underneath them and get a few drops to come off. I felt mm -hmm. a little drop mm -hmm. there. Oh, so, okay. Oh yeah, look at oh, this. Oh. So it's better than honeysuckle. Look at that. And then once you get those couple drops on there, you just kind of taste your mm -hmm. hand. And now nice. you know what a hummingbird's like. We're just <laughs> licking our hands here. <laughs> but you know, the sunbirds that pollinate these in South Africa will perch underneath mm -hmm. and then put their curved beak up into each of these flowers. Mm -hmm. So here in the States, you know, in North America, we have hummingbirds that hover and then go there. But in South Africa, their birds have to literally perch 
and then go into every flower. So much fun to watch that. Fascinating. And of course we have things like aloes, which yeah. are growing here at Longwood. And aloe flowers, I think, are underappreciated. They're really striking. They They're are. Really, and, and unlike agave, they rebloom. Absolutely. Yeah. So you'll have these things for a number of years. I never had an aloe flower in my home. It wasn't until really? I came to Longwood. I guess really? my plants weren't old enough. It wasn't huh. sunny enough. Yeah. But we have plenty of aloes blooming here. And uh, African aloes, African uriops, the yellow daisies down there, then our Asian cymbidiums. And then just to break it up a little bit, how about those uh, black leaf ficus? Yeah. So we start to have this yellow, orange, and black thing going mm -hmm. on, which you know, is great for the winter season, but come back next month. <laughs> and of course, the entire thing is going to change out again. How do you even maintain the grass in here? It's crazy. Oh my do gosh. You, you roll it out? Well, we will be rolling it out. The turf <laughs> is going to be changed out next month. So <laughs> the turf is growing in a relatively Watch shady the... location. Yeah. And uh, this shady location means that we do have to change it semi-regularly. Got it. But you know, we're changing most things out on a semi-regular basis. Something we're not changing, how about a big cycad over there? Yeah. Is that thing amazing? That's pretty impressive. So that one is, you know, extinct in the wild. Longwood which, was given. Which one is it? That's Encephalardos woodyi. Woodyi, okay, so that's the, is that the loneliest one? I think it is, yeah. just like, was it the, the, male. the tortoise? The male. It is yeah. a male. Yeah. So we were given that one back in the 1970s, and um, we actually propagated the pup off of it. Hmm. So we now have two of them. So, uh, but they're two males. They are, and they're actually clones they're, of each other, which yeah. is like, what is that, like mini me and Austin Powers? Yeah. It's almost weird, yeah. but don't get me talking about genetics. It's definitely <laughs> not my thing. But you know, here along with, we're not a botanical garden. We are, you know, just creating beautiful displays for, mm -hmm. you know, people to enjoy. If there's an interesting plant, that's great. But one thing we like to do is use ordinary plants in extraordinary ways. So you don't have to have rare plants to do something incredible. Here's a beautiful plant I love, this uh, philodendron, called golden xanadu. And it has this beautiful red underside there. Yeah, I was gonna say, this is a mu much more like a uh, chartreusier color than the one that you would typically see. Indeed, so this yeah. used to be available. In fact, I bought this one from a local garden center. Mm -hmm. And uh, this plant is now no longer commercially available. It's you, no longer commercially available. You'll find a couple here and there, yeah. maybe a collector has propagated one or two, but you can't buy 500 of them at a time. Yeah, okay. So that leads me to believe what's gonna happen with some of these cultivars that yeah. we have. I mean, yeah. it's all about save the environment, save mm -hmm. the rainforest, save the species, but what about some of the cultivars? Yeah. Well, you know, it's very interesting because uh, I, we, did, we toured an herbarium at one of my, my alma mater, Cornell University, and they brought in Liberty Hyde Bailey, and he was, they wanted to bring him on to show that horticulture can be a science as well, and so they have one of the largest collections of horticultural varieties of pressed plants. Oh, wow. So it's very interesting to be able to have that history to see what has come and gone over the years. Because it's, ta it's taken a lifetime for someone to discover this plant, mm -hmm. to preserve it, to propagate it, but then within a lifetime, it's lost again. Right. And it's in the next generation's responsibility to be like, mm -hmm. oh, I've never seen this. Right. You know, what can I do to right. you know, make this plant amazing in my own garden mm -hmm. or maybe introduce it to other people? Mm -hmm. But, you know, horticultural plants that you're mentioning are just as important uh, mm -hmm. to gardeners as a native plant is to a local pollinator. So in horticulture, what are we going to do to preserve those, to make people aware that they're out there? And uh, there are certain you know, gardens around the world that are doing a little bit with that. Here's a beautiful bird of paradise. Um, certainly we know the orange flowered bird of paradise, mm -hmm. but this one called Mandela's Gold mm. uh, was renamed uh, after Nelson Mandela was released from prison. Originally it was called Kirstenbosch Gold. Mm. So thank goodness you know, the National Botanic Gardens in South Africa saw this, recognized it, saved it, preserved it, and now named it yeah. so that you know, more people are aware of it. And of course it also brings a little more recognition to some of the important you know, things uh, from that country as well. Wow. This, this one also, that, I mean, it's, it's like a fruit <laughs> Is this like an oak? Oh, like great oak? question. Wow, that is such a fun plant. So we've got a few remnant flowers on there, but this is called oh, so stenocarpus. It's, it's not an oak, though. Not it, at all. It kind of feels like it has a quirkish shape. Leaf. It's a protea from wow. Australia. Wow. So it is just, you know, your mind just turns upside down when that you go to other parts of the world. Yeah. And this is a tropical proteaceous plant with orange flowers in the fall. I well, mean, when I, and I think of protea, I think of that like common one that you, ha you see in the horticultural trade for yep. like florists. With the big pink flowers, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So the family, the Proteaceous family, has tons of you know, genera mm -hmm. across the board, mostly, I'm going to say, from Southern Hemisphere. Uh, but this one, one of the ones that grows extremely well for us. Mm. So I definitely love it. Here's our little baby cycad. You know, we talked about uh, propagating from our extinct in the wild. Mm -hmm. This one took almost three years to actually take root, and now it's about four years actually growing. Uh, what I think is really fun about this one, if you look carefully at the foliage down here, you mm -hmm. see it has prickles on there. Yep. And what I like to say is, you know, young people, adolescents can sometimes be prickly, <laughs> and it's only once we get older that it sheds its prickles. So the foliage <laughs> actually so changes yeah. to something a little more, you know, calm and muted. Huh. So even plants can have their immature and juvenile growth, and then that can change over to something a little more mellow and subtle as it gets older. Now here's the similar philodendron, but it's less chartreuse-y. So Indeed. It, yeah, so it's a different um, cultivar, I'd imagine. So that's a reminder that yeah. whenever you're growing a plant, a normal plant, and yours mm -hmm. does something different, mm -hmm. you know, take note of it. Let someone else know about it. Share yeah. it with the world, because it could be the next most amazing thing in the garden. Just like that asparagus fern. I still can't believe that. I know. I, I definitely need it. more of that kind of thing in my yeah. life. Here's an example of a really fun renovation we did here at Longwood. We just planted these red stem palms yeah. last week. So we had a giant uh, phoenix palm over here that was about 15 years in the same spot. It had gotten a little too large. Mm -hmm. We had these incredible specimens left over. And here in the court of palms, this is working out just fine because we've got different types of palms, this mm -hmm. wonderful sable. Now sable has a really fun type of leaf. Are you familiar with the leaf shapes of palms? Uh, well, if you asked me all, all of them, I wouldn't know, but I know like some of them as they're expanding, they kind of break open, uh -huh. you know, and, they, and then as they're breaking open, they get this more like palmate shape, you know. That's it, yeah. definitely. And then the opposite of palmate would gonna be what? Did you? I don't know. Pinnates. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pinnate. So palmate and pinnate, the okay. two big ones. This one is kind of doing a weird thing, costa palmate. Oh. In that, look at that long, Funky. skinny center that kind of bends out. Yeah. So not just a straight leaf like our regular pinnate palms. Right. And not a regular palmate, uh -huh. but a little bit of both. Huh. So in horticulture, don't we love to collect those oddities? Yeah. Things that just really. aren't quite normal. If you look at the flooring down here, it's our quarter palms has this palm inlay. Ah. So again, another kind of reminder as to what this space is. Common palms like Adenidia coming from the Philippines, unusual palms like the Coco Thrinax with all the hairs on it. Mm -hmm. So each little area here, you can kind of explore and learn a little bit more about them. Yeah. The foxtail palm, this is probably one of the newer palms to hit the world, only discovered in the late 1980s, I believe, which wow, is pretty is crazy. new in the far northern reaches of Australia. I guess nobody was venturing up there. But because it was new and it was exciting, people went crazy for it. Yeah. And it's now been planted around the world. And we're finding that it's hybridizing with so many other palms, which is opening up different types of huh. questions about it, it moving looks, plants around. It kind of looks a very similar kind of the fishtail palm-esque, you know, a little bit like that. Definitely. And the good thing yeah. about this one, I love it, is it's got this three-dimensional foliage. Mm -hmm. So not just I that flat, yeah. but literally it's the like foliage world. goes all the way around. Yeah. I love that. And of course, it surrounds this wonderful basin down here. Now, do you have any idea what this basin might be made of? This is one of the fun things I think about Longwood. As you're walking by, you know, you're really getting into something, you might not notice something else, but how what about do you this think? one? What do you think, Sonder? It looks like some kind of stone, but I bet it's made of palms. Ah, it'd be great if it was, <laughs> but you got it right the first time. I was stone. thinking marble. Marble is a definitely a good guess. Now, but, what's what's harder than marble? Uh, what's granite? That is exactly yeah. right. Have you ever seen blue granite? Not really, I don't think. I hear there's only one quarry in the world that has blue granite. <laughs> and we got one of the last pieces out of it. So wow. that is blue granite from Brazil. And notice there's no sign on it. So when you walk by this, you think, eh. I mean, certain people even say it's made of plastic. I was like, oh. yeah. gasp, it is yeah. not made of plastic. <laughs> but this is you know, a beautiful museum quality piece that we yeah. have just tucked in the garden with no blinking signs mm -hmm. or anything to say, this is amazing. Hmm. And we treat it exactly the same as we do these little terrace ferns, mm -hmm. which you can buy at your local garden centers. It's true. We've got little Metallica, Chamaderia, yeah. you know, somewhat unusual 
camellias, clivias, philodendrons, all creating this you know, menagerie of plants that wouldn't occur naturally in the world. Okay. So it's a great place to kind of let your your mind flow. And these are in bloom too. Is this ah. a caliandra or what is this? Look at that. You got it right. Caliandra. Yeah. So this little caliandra, Surinamensis. Lots of people that grow up uh, in the deep south will of course recognize Albizia. Yes. Which is in the same family. Same family. The bean family. Yeah. Uh, but the joy about this one is it blooms all year long mm -hmm. as long as it's warm. So I've seen this in butterfly houses before, mm -hmm. and the really fun thing here at Longwood is at night, you know, the leaves close up. So you come during the like day, a it is, of, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. And you'll have this green canopy during the day, but you mm -hmm. come at night and all you see are pink puffs just floating <laughs> in the nighttime sky. Cycads are really fun, and one of our larger cycads we've got oh, over here, yeah. indeed. You know, the fun thing too is you look at this layering on the cycad, and we can see the year it had leaves, mm -hmm. and the year it reproduced, mm -hmm. leaves, reproduced, leaves, reproduced, and it just keeps going all the way up. So not growth rings, yeah. but kind of, it yeah, shows it you its, own its kind, evolution. Yeah. And this plant, you know, apparently had something happen to it in life. Maybe it was outdoors, and then it was dug up and put into a pot, and now it's come indoors. Mm -hmm. This was long before I got here. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, cycads live to be hundreds of years old, and they are just you know, some of the oldest plants yeah. in the world. As we approach our patio of oranges here, this goes back to some great design here at Longwood. Uh, certainly we have citrus trees growing, because citrus are a part of Longwood's history. The fragrance of citrus, mm. Mr. DuPont was you know, harvesting citrus before people lived in Florida. But these containers were designed specifically here at Longwood. So any idea what this container would be perfect for? Perhaps it's a long day, it's five o'clock, you know. A drink? <laughs> Absolutely, designed to be cocktail tables. It's, it's a shelf. <laughs> so you can have a conversation underneath the tree in a container that was designed here at Longwood. Yep. And then when you look at the edges of these pots, notice how that pointy edge there echoes the same in our drains down here. So we've carried that into the architecture. We must love the details. It's pretty cool. And then beyond the drains, it actually carries into the lanterns that we have. Because if you look at the base of the lanterns, yeah. we still have that little triangular mm. diamond at Even the bottom. Even the edges of here. So we've thought yeah. about you know everything in this yeah. garden. And I think that is you know one of the joys of working in a space that's you know created mm -hmm. is the fact that we've had the opportunity to kind of put all these things together. But we get that amazing view down to the far end of the conservatory. You have these three tall waterfalls. When you were standing at the other end, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have seen those. Right. So it invites you to travel around the garden and get a different vantage point from one side versus the other. Yeah, and there's a lot of movement in this, in this garden. And that's one of my favorite things about being here is you just pick a spot and then you look out across the garden. Mm -hmm. And are you looking at color? Are you looking at texture? Are you looking for flowers? Are you just enjoying the fragrance? Mm. And you kind of have all those things happening in one spot. I also love the Schiffleras. I want to point those out because they have that nice pop of lime green. Oh, yes. Always good to be, you know, stick them in a dark corner or whatever. They really pop. Colored foliage is definitely one of my passions. So thank you for picking that out. It is mm -hmm. one of my favorite plants. Mm -hmm. uh, that golden Schifflera is a cultivar called Soleil mm -hmm. Amate. And it was one of the tropical plant industry expos top plants maybe 10 years ago. And uh, it's still available in Florida, not as popular as it was the first year. But it does give you a little pop mm -hmm. of that bold texture to the right of it, the dark leaves of that quarter line, a nice contrast. Mm -hmm. So in design, I think you know, contrasts are exciting mm -hmm. and complements are harmonizing. So what type of gardening do you like? What I like? Well, indoors, it's completely different than outdoors. Absolutely. But indoors, I personally love the small insignificant plants that people often overlook. So I'm a big lover of peperomia. Actually. Oh, yes. You would have to put in a lot of peperomia to fill a space like this. <laughs> well, now that you mention it, let's go look at those peperomia. I love it when someone gives me a challenge. It's like, how many peperomia does one like? I know. It's like, how many licks does it take to get to the, the Tootsie Roll and the Tootsie Roll Pop? It's like, how many peperomias does it take to fill up Longwood? <laughs> 
So we were inspired by Peperomia this past year, and this little one called Frost is yeah. you know, one of my favorites. <laughs> Look at that cute little texture, contrasting with this little selaginella, mm -hmm. and then just a little pop of color with the Kalanchoes as well. And this is just one way to use Peperomias. Yeah. I think this is a very you know, calming kind of effect. But then across the way, we've got silver Peperomias with our black Samiococcus, mm. so a little bit more of a contrast kind of that black and silver going on. And what's the idea here? It looks like um, it looks like you had a flood. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, everything at Longwood is intentional. Yeah. So the beautiful exhibition hall floor is original to the estate when it uh -huh. was built in the 1920s. Uh, this is made of marble. So the other areas that we saw were made of granite. So marble was the stone of choice back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, this marble has never been moved or changed. So this is original to Mr. DuPont's day. And he designed this floor to actually be an exhibition floor for his floral displays, but he wanted to be able to then drain it down and have a party. So in the 1920s, of course, lavish parties and having a good time with everything. Mm -hmm. This was a dual purpose space. Hmm. So we were inspired by that same concept, dual purpose, when designing new spaces, hmm. to always have a dual purpose. Hmm. So some of our gardens uh, back over here, filled with plants, but if you come back in about a month, that is literally a water feature underneath mm. it. So people might say, there were flowers here last week, but now it's a pond. Yeah. Yes, we can change it up just that much yeah. whenever we're enjoying these spaces. You know, other palms that are really great, I love this one. If you're familiar with the Hawia, yes. so these are the Kentia palms, and Kentia palms are you know, one of the best indoor palms because they're so tolerant of low light. Yeah, what are some of the keys of palm care? I'm curious because it's not something that I've really ventured into in, in my in house plants. Well, you know, I love palms mm -hmm. and palms are super easy as long as you get the right one. Mm -hmm. So number one, plant selection. So mm -hmm. choose a Kentia, the Hawia, and these guys are gonna be almost effortless. Mm -hmm. They tolerate low light, they don't get any pest problems. Mm -hmm. Life is good. Conversely, if you choose a plant that is easily available, something that's commercially produced, something that's inexpensive, mm -hmm. it may not be good for your environment. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's susceptible to spider mites. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna do well in the low light and you'll feel like you don't have a green thumb. Mm -hmm. But again, it all goes back to plant selection. Got it. So literally, this one is a nine out of 10 when it comes to ease and care. What do you think, what do you think would be the second? The most? second best is yeah. called Raphis. Raphis Excelso. Yeah, the little okay. lady finger yes, palm, yeah. super easy. But which ones are always available? Right. The Majesty Palms. They're yeah. $10 at the big box stores. I know. But then I you know. bring it home and it just starts to shrivel up and you're yeah. like, what am I doing wrong? I it's but not I think you. The, sh the Shamadoria, I think, are also fairly, you know. They're pretty good. Yeah. I'll give them a five and a half or six. Oh, interesting yeah. that you put them so low. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, there's so many other things that just take all my love here. <laughs> but yeah, you are mentioning earlier too, the fish gel palms. Yeah. I think those guys are super fun. Right, we right. just planted these two weeks ago. So uh, this was ficus mm -hmm. previously, and the fish gel palms are one of the more unusual ones in that they have a botanical term, bipinnately compound mm -hmm. leaf. Mm -hmm. I mean, for those who just love, I mean, look at that. Yeah. I just love that. Each leaf, again, individually different. Uh, they it almost like remind me. They've been taking through a little shredder a little bit. Exactly, yeah. and they yeah. remind me of also maiden here. Yeah, for leaflets. Yeah, because yeah, they've got that straight edge, yeah. and then the reproductive part is right there on the it's corner. Mm -hmm. So it just makes me think that you know when the world was being created, we had some reproductions. You mm. know, so here's a little plant and doppelganger. It's like you know Adiantum and Cariota. They kind of have similar mm. textures going there. It's interesting to see the leaves also emerging here. Oh, aren't they beautiful? Yeah, this like fresh one coming up out here. So that beautiful new growth comes yeah. out, kind of a light green. Yeah. And you know, the interesting thing about Cariota, they flower from the, was it the top down or the bottom up? I can't remember anymore. It's been so long yeah. since I've seen well, them. There's, here's one that's like- Oh in, yeah, there yeah. we go. Wow, those are so cool. Yeah. So I think they bloom from the bottom up. Huh. But either way, they are just starting to come into flower here. They're, supposedly that entire stem is gonna die once uh, that one finishes flowering, hmm. but it's a suckering palm, a clustering right. palm, mm -hmm. so you'll continuously have those you know, new plants coming on. Gosh, look at the bamboo, huh? Ooh, we love some Crazy. bamboo. Bamboo is definitely a plant that you want to be careful with. Yeah. Uh, fortunately for us, we planned ahead, and this bamboo actually has a stainless steel barrier 
keeping it from escaping. Let's see if we can find you, that so one. So you're even afra afraid of it escaping within the conservatory. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we've created that little stainless steel barrier there so that it cannot get into the rest of the garden. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't mean it can't crawl over the top that's right. of the stainless that's right. steel that's barrier. Right. And I won't say if that's happened before. <laughs> but uh, these happen to be <clears throat> tropical bamboos, so they certainly are in no chance going to be invading well, look, our garden. this one here. has a little powdery cast to it Indeed as well. Indeed it does. So this one's yeah. called Dendrocalmnus. And uh, there's so many different types of bamboos. You know, we think about Philostachys, mm -hmm. the one that kind of grows outdoors in much of the East United States. But this happens to be Dendrocalmnus. We mm -hmm. also have the genus Bambusa. Mm -hmm. So each bamboo is going to have a different look, whether it be color or size of the culm. But what is so cool about bamboos is the fact that they apparently are connected in the world, meaning lots of bamboos are blooming right now. So we've got some flowers in our bamboo up there, and just those little kind of dangly bits there, yeah. you don't see bamboos flower very often. No, and, in fact, and it's a grass, so it has like a big inflorescence like a grass. <laughs> It's big, yeah. 30 feet tall. Yeah. But the interesting thing, you know, once a bamboo palm flowers, that one, the entire thing dies. Really? So now we have entire huh. clumps of bamboo dying around the world huh. at the same time. So somehow bamboo is connected. It just knows it's time to flower. Like the cicadas, mm -hmm. when they come out, you know, they're 17 year march. And, and also um, you have those fireflies that somehow synchronize, even if you take them away, and put them in a different part of the world, they're still synchronized. They still know. Yeah. Plants are special that way. Black bamboo down here. Black bamboo, it's very, very striking. So not Philostachys, which is the running bamboo. Mm -hmm. This is actually bamboo silaco, a tropical bamboo. <laughs> but what we've done here is, you know, contrasted that black stem with some light colored foliages underneath. Yeah. Again, giving you that excitement in black and white. Speaking of excitement, I think one of the most exciting houseplants that has hit the market is this black leaf Zamia colchis. Oh, yeah. So this plant, thank goodness, it's available to everybody. You can find this at your local garden centers. It was or... so expensive at first, but then they brought it out and you could get it for like 15 bucks at the grocery so store. So then the question is, is it special? Because you can buy it at it the grocery store special. for $15? Especially because there hasn't been so many different cultivars of the ZZ plant. I feel like it revived people's interest of the, the ZZ plant. I like that. Know? That's a great way. And really, look at how perfect that foliage is. Yeah. I mean, it's just magical the way that it contrasts with other silver plants in the landscape. Right. Especially in a white building or a white house. Yeah, you know? and we don't even have it here, but the new growth is like a lime green. Yes, you know, so. definitely. Well, this is our original plant. And uh, this one, I think it's about time to be repotted. I was looking at it the other day yeah. and I don't know if this one would even come out of its pot, but the roots on this thing are so Oh yeah, it's thick. so meaty. Isn't that crazy? It doesn't mind being root bound though, surprisingly. That's a very know? good point. Yeah. So with lots of our house plants, I think we run the risk of over potting them. Yeah. And then they get over watered. Mm -hmm. But if you can let the plant be a little pot bound, mm -hmm. generally it'll dry out more quickly, which in turn will help it to, I think, last a little bit longer mm. inside your home. I mean, I, I went to, uh, Missouri Botanic Garden where they have a lot of aroids and I was amazed to see how you know how root bound some of their plants were and they're <laughs> no, just doing fine they're fine no doubt you know when you look at aroids look at this anthurium oh, yeah so this leaf I think is pretty cool I mean is the way that ruffles or fruffles fruffles I believe that's yeah, it yeah and then of course the flower reminds us yep mm -hmm. that's definitely the <laughs> family aracee yeah. but you know not going to be nearly as showy mm -hmm. as you know some of the other ones Maybe one of the more showy ones we have her kind of hidden over here, Pink Princess. So funny. Which became a hot commodity. I got Pink Princess 20 years ago for $12. It used, used to be affordable, exactly. not no longer. And what makes it so special? Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful, don't get me wrong, but it was just as beautiful then mm -hmm. as it is now. So it's all about, you know, trending yeah. things. Yeah, demand, pink, the pink color, all Indeed. that type of stuff. Yeah. I absolutely love that one. Other really fun uh, plants we have, I love this little aphalandra. Mm -hmm. This just shows the diversity. This little guy, I believe, was it snowflake? Yeah, snowflake. Has uh, you know, twice as much white in it, which mm -hmm. means it grows twice as slowly, or maybe I should say it doesn't grow. 
but uh, looking for all those different forms of familiar plants. Mm -hmm. you know, I've grown the zebra plant since I was a kid, and then when I saw this one, ooh, it's like, you know, it's a different color shirt right. of your favorite style or something. The inflorescence is kind of neat too. It kind of is more, is it quadrangular or something? It exactly. Has, it has edges. It know, does. Yeah. Only like building blocks. It's yeah. just like a little building up there. Yeah. The other really cool variegates, we've got this wonderful Hedicium up here. This one's called Vanilla Ice. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if anyone remembers that guy from, was it the 90s or oh, something? Oh, yeah. Ice, ice, baby. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. But this is a really fun, you know, summertime annual. Uh, super easy to overwinter like cannas. Just yep. dig up the rhizomes and kind of hang on to them until the spring season. And who cares if it flowers? But if it does flower, you've got that incredible uh, fragrance that comes with it. One of your other cycads. Oh, I love this. This is one of the first cycads I grew as a kid, and it taught me to speak Latin because the species on this one is uh, Zamia furfuracee. Furfuracee, like so, with the fur. Double the fur on yeah. it, and you know, anytime you say a word twice, you mm -hmm. just have to chuckle. <laughs> fur, fur, ace. And of course, every plant family ends in ace. Yeah. So it's kind of easy to put those things together. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. super easy, great as a house plant. Uh, super, you know, cardboardy. You can Very cardboardy. see how yeah. hard those uh, leaves are. It almost feels fake, you know? So anything that's got a leaf that hard means yeah. it's going to be super easy yeah. to maintain. I, I agree. We saw a really cool oh, Schifflera yeah. earlier with the gold foliage, but how about this Schifflera with the yeah. you know, dark foliage? Yeah. So this uh, recently, I guess recently, got a name change. Right, I, right. It used to be Aralias, right? Indeed. And yeah. then I think the name was Dizzy Gothica. Dizzy, yeah. And now it's Schifflera. So huh. thank goodness we're simplifying things, but yes. look at that in incredible leaf. I mean, so delicate, so dark. It just really is just so unusual. It is goth, yeah. yeah. That's becoming so popular again. Yeah, yeah. Everything just goes up and down. <laughs> I don't know if we have any Clivias. Oh my gosh, we do oh, have a Clivia. Oh, and, it, and, it's, and it's got the creamy yellow color. Yeah, God. so you know, is, uh, Longwood, unusual. it is unusual. You know, orange is kind of the color for Clivia, yeah. and yellow was kind of the recessive trait. Right. So over 40 years ago, Longwood started breeding Clivias, mm -hmm. and we have at least five that we've introduced. And mm -hmm. our first one to be introduced was Longwood Debutante. Mm -hmm. So we released this one to the world. It was extremely expensive, but mm -hmm. we found that this one reproduced quite readily, mm -hmm. and now we have a huge swath of them, mm -hmm. and we'll actually be transplanting these to our new West Conservatory when it opens in November of 2024. Okay. So you saw it here first. Saw it here first, and then we'll have to come back in 2024 to see the new digs. Can't wait that long. We're gonna have so many things changing before that happens. <laughs> you know, outdoors camellias are absolutely beautiful, and that's one of the things that Mr. DuPont was collecting when he first opened the conservatory. Let's see if I can bring this oh, one. Oh, you just oh, Who wants that one? <laughs> we want the better one. But Camellia japonica certainly were popular in you know, European mm. gardens because it's so much milder over there. And of course, here in the United States, people wanted camellias. They didn't think they would grow outdoors in our area. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we found that there are lots of camellias that do survive, mm. even into zone six and seven. Interesting. So Camellia japonica has some of the most beautiful flowers, winter blooming, mm -hmm. so many different petals, colors, some even have a scent to them. Mm. The glossy green foliage, I think, is great you know, for cut flower arrangements. Right. And uh, there's just so many great things to say about camellias, not to mention the fact they're so historic you know, mm. in the world with their history dating back to Asia and how they came to the United States, you know, the breeding that happened with them. It's such a fun plant. And you have to come like at the right time for the, the blooms. I, I, we had never done this, the tour of the planting fields arboretum in oh, Long Island, yes. but they have a whole camellia section. I was just there, and yeah, oh, that was you? built okay. really the same time that Longwood yeah. was in the 1920s. And uh, that was when you could bring plants into the country full yeah. size. Yeah. So they were digging up plants this size from France and shipping them across the ocean and then planting them. And uh, who knew that that was going to start an entire you know, thing yeah. with a totally different kind of plant. We have a few more camellias down here just to show you some of the fun diversity mm -hmm. that they have. So this oh, yeah. little one, mm -hmm. I mean, a much smaller flower. And notice how the petals are ruffled, mm -hmm. serrated, yeah. pinked, truncated. I don't know. <laughs> which, which term do you want to use? But uh, again, look at the diversity. Yeah. Just so much. There's also one that I saw recently that looked like um, 
looked at the geometry of it, like oh, the yes. like kind of kaleidoscopic in a way. It was very, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. And uh, that's, again, the joy of camellias. I was laughing, too, because so many camellias have a name of perfection. Yeah. So Taylor's perfection is something, because <laughs> the flowers are so perfect. Yeah. And, you know, and why wouldn't you just absolutely love something like that? You know, when we talk about ordinary plants that Monstros. make people go crazy, yeah. I mean, is that not just the funnest thing? And in fact, we had some fruits on here earlier. Oh, I tasted them for the first time. But I think the key is you don't want to eat too much. Okay. There must be something in the fruits that kind of burns your lip. You can feel it oh. going down your throat. Oh. And after I had my little bite, I was thinking, that's quite enough. I like, don't need anymore. Like more. burn in the way that if you eat too many pineapples? Maybe. Like I think so. Kind yeah, of yeah. Thing? Something yeah. like there's some chemical in hmm. certain tropical fruits that, you know, we're not all yeah. meant to be <laughs> ingesting on a regular this basis. This one is flowering like crazy. Ooh, right look now. at that. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And this one's pretty old. This is mm -hmm. going to be at least eight to 10 years old in the same container. So going back to, you know, being a little bit pot bound. And uh, it really makes a difference. So the, these kind of like can propagate very similarly to other, you know, the tenanthes and everything. So they could fall down and you could kind of cut them here or they, they touch, take root. touch down and take Absolutely. root. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have uh, the Neo America, a little walking iris. Right. That will yeah, kind of the do the same iris. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way that the flowers will kind of hang down to the edge and then mm -hmm. poof, they just take root from there. Well, speaking of taking root, I mean, look at the roots on the ficus. So it cracks me up that, you know, Ficus, this has been in Daikia, cultivar Amstel King. The, I love the bark. Isn't that yeah, fun, yeah. the lentisols all over yeah, there? Yeah, the lentisols, yeah. So then you look at the trunk, you're like, that's cool. But then you're looking back here in the back, mm -hmm. and you're like, wait a minute, what are these things? That's a trunk. Um, that's a root. Yeah. So the aerial root in a humid condition will literally just you know, start, and then once it hits the ground, it mm. forms a new trunk. Mm. And that's what's so fun about ficus. Mm. I mean, the genus ficus in general, there's just so much diversity. So much diversity. We Leaf actually color. have an episode coming out on that. So oh. that's like a Can't wait to see that one. Fascinating, yeah. And the well, foliage colors as well. Yeah. Variegates, dark foliage, light color. There's just so much to see in ficus. I like how you can actually see the um, understory of the, uh, the alopecia here as well. And you know, that was inspired specifically by a garden visit I took in Chicago. And they had one of those plants, and the light was coming through at the perfect time. Mm -hmm. And I said, where can we do this at Longwood? Right. And we have this elevated bed in the children's garden. And of course, you see that chartreuse vein mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. I said, what do we have that's chartreuse mm -hmm. that can pick up that same color? And a star was born. Mm -hmm. So you never know when your moment of inspiration is going to be. And it's not just going to a place one time. Sometimes you have to go at the right time. At the right time to see that light streaming Absolutely. Through. The time of the year or the time of the yeah. day. These ferns are really fun. I love Platycerium. I've been growing these since I was a kid. And uh, you've got you know, two types of fronds here. Those reproductive fronds that are kind of shooting out, mm -hmm. which have that really fun little brown, I call it cinnamon dipped. Tip. Yeah, yeah, it does I mean, look like a cinnamon dip. Just tip. literally yeah. dip the whole thing in cinnamon. Yeah. And then you've got the non reproductive fronds, mm -hmm. which are just holding on to whatever it's growing onto, whether it be a flower pot or a tree trunk or whatever. But as I was growing these as a kid, I just found that they would literally envelop the entire pot to right. the point that you couldn't even water the plant. Yeah. And it was a reminder, too, these don't need a lot of water. Mm. You know, we think of ferns as being very moisture loving. But I was in Florida this past week, and these were literally wilted because it's the dry season in South yeah. Florida, and they can handle a lot of drought. So, well, and they also have really thick leaves again. Indeed, yeah. and covered in that hairy yeah. silver coating there. So a reminder not to overwater those platycerium. Mm -hmm. I think the children's garden is such a fun spot to see where plants have inspired us. You've got things like you know the water lily fountains down there. Right with actual flowers and leaves. And of course, the plants have to be pretty tough in order to survive. So of course, Epipremnum pothos, yeah. one of the toughest plants you can get. Oh, got, a, got an Epipremnum in my face. And then of course, you just appreciate you know, the, the details. It's such a common plant, but yeah. the aerial rootlets on there, the different types of variegation. And, you know, the fun thing about Epipremnum when they grow downward, their leaves are quite small. Mm. But when they attach to a wall or a tree trunk, their leaves expand yeah. almost three times the size when they're going upright. Oh, there's that quadrangular there flower. There it is, yeah. It's a cool, cool flower. And of course, more of the tiny little 
rabbit's foot ferns yeah. covering our maze. So this is one of our first vertical walls. Uh, this literally, it's, you could say it's like dog wire stuffed with moss. Hmm. And then little baby ferns were put in there and they literally just covered the entire wall so that we have just a tiny planter on the top. Good for the children's exhibit so they don't hit their face, you know. It's like exactly. A little, they a can buffer. brush up against yeah. it as yeah. much as they want to. <laughs> And of course, Guzmania is one of my favorite bromeliads. And uh, what makes this one so fantastic is the fact that you know, the leaves are smooth. You know, yeah. There's no nasty spines on there. Because so many of the things like the Echnia, they mm -hmm. will have just vicious yes. spines. But you these know, guys You have to really think about this in the children's garden. Exactly. <laughs> it's got to be tough, but at the same time, it's got to be beautiful. Oh, wow. You got here just the right day for this one. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Can we eat it? <laughs> not this one, unfortunately. <laughs> but is that not the craziest flower? That is so cool. So what you got there is a nematanthus. So I love nematanthus. It's in the family of you know, Yes. And uh, we recognize other like Gisneriads. Goldfish plants. And goldfish things like plants that, yeah. and things like African violets and gloxinias. There's a lot of little ants coming out of this. Do you think that there's some kind of like Ooh, ant They're ants? probably farming kind of? the, um, the nectar that's yeah, inside maybe. there. But that flower, I think, is so unusual. Mm -hmm. You look deep inside, you've got some little speckles that are going on. You've got all the hairs. I mean, just dissecting. Maybe I was too curious as a yeah. child. Yeah. But just dissecting a flower mm -hmm. and looking at the reproductive parts. I mean, it's just its a fun thing to do on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The spots are really amazing on the inside. I love it. And then the calices you know, at the bottom down there, yeah. I mean, that's just beautiful in and of itself. But just Nariads make such good houseplants. They're so tolerant of low lights. Really underappreciated. They haven't made their uh, moment. They don't they haven't had their moment yet. In their the moment world. again. But again. There that's you go. That's what I mean. Again. But it you've got to visit Linden Lion Greenhouse. Okay. So that's just Where's outside that? of Albany. Okay. And it absolutely is to die for. Oh. I literally go nuts every time I go there. They've got so many cool plants. I love. Look at this one with the oh. whole stripes. This is like a uh, a Tim Plow. Like what is this called? A Quisnelia. Quesnelia wow. marmorata. Yeah, marmorata. Tim, is this the cultivar? I don't have the cultivar on okay. that one. They said it was a straight species, but, but look it at looks this. just like this it. It's really weird. And of course, I tell people this one looks like it went to the, the beauty parlor. It's got the curl at the yeah. tip of every leaf there. So elevating these up, you know, so people can see them. But did mm -hmm. you notice something a little unusual about our Kalanchoe oh, down oh, here? These are a little variation. Exactly. Of the so just building. a little bit of yeah. detail, really, in everything that we do. Right. And then of course these uh, Dracaenas, mm -hmm. new little cultivar called Tornado, which is dwarf and also mm -hmm. kind of spinning around. Mm -hmm. So bringing those details up a little bit. Right. So and playful. You know, it's got to be a little playful and fun. Absolutely. And whimsical. For the children, just to be yeah. engaged a little bit more. I love to remind people, houseplants, you know, they need renovation every now and again. And you know, things like Dracaena, certainly we've seen these before. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is a great way of showing how much you can renovate a Dracaena. <laughs> one giant cut, mm -hmm. another giant cut, another giant cut, mm -hmm. and the plant just keeps on regrowing. Right. So when your plants are happy, you need to keep them pruned, mm -hmm. keep them in shape. Also gives you an opportunity to do some propagation. Yeah. You know, practice propagation as well. Yeah. You'll never know what you can do until you try it. <laughs> this is like a maze. I feel like we've walked through, like we've walked miles in here. And that's just round one. Yeah. And then when you go back and look at something else, I mean, that's you're like, pretty cool begonia. You didn't notice look this begonia color. the first time. No, look at that color. I though. mean, isn't that nuts? It's coral. It's coral colored. Glowing yeah. in the light. And what I love to do is kind of go through social media and see what pictures people are posting mm -hmm. at Longwood. Right. And someone shared an image of this begonia. And I was like, here it is. It's hiding underneath a water fountain. Yeah. But they discovered it. Yeah. So not everything is going to be you know, right in right. your face. Yeah. yeah. And the Parischia, you know, yeah. one of the few cacti that actually has foliage. Yeah. So many of them are you know, photosynthesizing through their stems. There's a grouping of these foliest cacti that have recently been, maybe it was within the last number of years, uh, have been reconfigured in different ge genera. Indeed. I, don't, so, I, don't, I haven't explored that topic whew, yet. But, that's Sunday afternoon's yeah. reading, it's yeah. trying to figure all those out. Yeah. But you know, looking at this wonderful combination of dark foliage and light foliage, here's a really fun begonia down here, hmm. uh, canary wing. Hmm. So this is an example of you know, a trending plant that has just gone nuts. Uh, a sport of dragon wing, hmm. which we certainly all know, uh, came about when 
a gardener out in Ohio found a single leaf that was yellow wow. in his dragon wing. And from that single leaf, he then propagated a cutting, and then he shared that yeah. you know, with the right people, and now it's gone around the world. Wow, that's cool. So keep your eyes open for yes. those little unusual things. Yes. You might be changing the world. How about hanging baskets? You know, I love putting things you know, over your head, kind yeah. of surrounding yourself. Look up, look around, and we've got Croton as hanging baskets. Well, we're not always like trained to look up, even when we're like walking in the city and you see the skyscrapers or whatever. <laughs> exactly. We rarely, rarely look up, especially when we're looking at our phones all the time. <laughs> That's so true too. It's a good encouragement to look up. Yeah, and I've never seen crotons as a hanging basket plant. And that's what I try to remind everyone is just literally close your eyes and stop thinking about what is supposed to be mm -hmm. and think about what can be. Mm -hmm. And if you have a favorite plant and you want to put it somewhere, try it. There's nothing to say that you might not have the, the key to making it work. So it's I so funny in, when you said, you said that, don't, don't think about what, what it should be, in, or, or, you know, just like, you know, do, I just think that that is the philosophy of Thailand. I feel like they are masters around just like contorting plants into ways that they would, you know, like to see them. You know? Absolutely. And why not try something a little different? Mm -hmm. And you know, the Tradescantia, wonderful little house plant. But the fact that we've got, you know, these hanging orbs. Mm -hmm. And you know, one thing I just I love to, you know, observe people enjoying the garden. And you'll have people out here and they'll just kind of raise their hands <laughs> and then just start spinning around. And I'm thinking, I hope you've got, you know, someone to catch you because a few too many spins. We you might be on the ground. The pennies and nickels. <laughs> I love that he's watering, like washing the leaves right now. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, when we're practicing our integrated pest management mm -hmm. here at Longwood, the first step is to choose plants that are tough mm -hmm. and can be resilient. The next step, grow them well. Mm -hmm. After that, using mechanical means. Yeah, so, so like sharp sprays of water, keeping the mealy bugs down or whatever. So that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're washing the leaves mm -hmm. off. You know, outdoors, Mother Nature's going to do that. Mm -hmm. Indoors, we have to do it. Yeah. Uh, removing foliage that might uh, be old or damaged mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's where insects are going to be gathering. And uh, it's just that constant maintenance mm -hmm. and grooming. Mm -hmm. So if you've got your eye on the garden, mm -hmm. then nothing's going to get out of control. You're right. not going to have a massive weed infestation because you've watched them when they first started. Right. You're not going to have a massive pest infestation because you've been watching those leaves. And the minute a single pest emerges, mm -hmm. then you can start by washing it off or mm -hmm. removing that leaf, and then you don't have to use any chemicals. So we're greatly reducing any type of uh, chemical needs by choosing the right plant and growing it well. Well, this has just been an exquisite tour. Unbelievable. I mean, you have your work cut out for you, but you clearly love it. And you've been here for 25 years. So, it, so you can see things through and you see trends come and go. And you create some of those trends, and they come and Well, go that's too. a lot of responsibility, but yeah. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> it's been absolutely fantastic to have you guys here. This yes. is such a marvelous garden. I love sharing with people, and I certainly invite you guys to come back another time. And we will, now that I know that it, uh, it turns over so quickly. <laughs> There's always something to see. There's good no out. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Stay tuned here, because we'll have a tour of the Orchid Conservatory and the Orchid Greenhouses at Longwood. Now, if you're loving these tours, Give the video a thumbs up, consider tipping or becoming a sustaining member, and subscribe to the channel so you never miss a video. If you're looking to deepen your houseplant knowledge, we have a number of online courses and materials at your disposal, from Houseplant Basics to the Houseplant Masterclass. They can be found on homesteadbrooklyn.com and houseplantmasterclass.com. We'll see you in the next video.